Hello, my name is Tosca Bruno van Vijfijk and I direct the Transnational NGO Initiative here at the Maxwell School. Uh, we regularly invite visitors and today I have Mr. Alp Aslanagan. He is the Executive Director of the Alliance for Shared Values, which is one of the NGOs in, here in the U.S. representing the Hizmet or Gulen movement in the U.S. So, um, Mr. Aslanagan, thank you so much for having, for this, having this interview today and I look forward to your talk uh, uh, later today. Mm -hmm. So, we invited you because the Hizmet or Gulen movement is an example of a globally operating faith-based uh, movement. Um, tell us a little bit more, for those who don't know about the Hizmet or Gulen movement, what is the nature of the movement, what is the mission? Uh, it is a social movement uh, which seeks to combine uh, personal spiritual growth uh, with social action. Uh, so it is based on the premise that uh, spiritually everyone uh, can do uh, better, can uh, grow our potentials uh, and uh, realize our potentials, but that is not uh, enough that we have to put that in action in improving our societies. Mm -hmm. So starting in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, several hundred NGOs today have been formed and uh, it is estimated that millions of people participate in this uh, transnational movement. I see. And so um, you are, if I understand it right, in the Islamic faith-based movement. How do you situate the Hizmet movement in the global uh, ecosystem, if you will, of Islamic faith-based organizations? Uh, in terms of its uh, founders and the vast majority of its participants, uh, they are uh, Muslims. But it is not a religious movement, uh, it is open to all. Its basic premise is that there are certain high human values uh, where uh, people of different backgrounds can gather. Mm. Uh, therefore, uh, it was established by Muslims, but it is open to all. I see, and it sounds it's more like a faith-inspired faith movement exactly. than faith-based exactly. in, in an institutional sense. Exactly. Right. So, um, we're always interested in you also as a person. So tell us how you, how did you get involved in the Hizmet movement and how did you become a leader? Uh, my first encounter was actually, uh, was through a publication uh, where uh, Mr. Uh, Gulen, uh, who is the inspirational founder of the movement, uh, helped publish. Uh, it was a scientific magazine uh, which gave the uh, perspective of a faithful citizen on science. Uh, later on, I met with his students. Uh, I got involved in some interest groups, like a writer's group. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in writing, uh, translating. Uh, I was writing articles for a science magazine uh, in Turkey. Uh, later on, I got involved uh, with other NGOs and served on their boards. Uh, and all this time, I was serving on a volunteer capacity. Mm -hmm. And within the last uh, three years, uh, I actually ad accepted uh, an offer to serve uh, in a professional capacity. In the last three years, yes. I see. And that's very interesting how, how that came about. Um, and I, I'm, for a moment, I'm drawing an analogy with um, uh, academics here in the U.S. who are uh, proclaimed Christians and who are uh, reconciling that with being involved in, in science. Um, so tell us a little bit about, when you think about currently about two or three of the challenges that the Hizmet movement is facing, what are some of those and how are you tackling these uh, as, as movement organizations? Yes. Uh, well, one challenge actually relates to uh, uh, its transnational growth. Uh, the movement started in Turkey and remained in Turkey for a few decades. Uh, around uh, 1980s, uh, the late 1980s, uh, uh, during the era of uh, Prime Minister and President Özal, uh, Turkey opened up globally. And with this, a movement participants also had a chance to uh, uh, visit and move to other countries. And starting in the Central Asian countries, uh, the movement became increasingly transnational. Mm. So this uh, transnational growth uh, brought uh, questions and challenges uh, with it because uh, predominantly the original founders and participants were Turkish Muslims. And first, uh, they encountered uh, with uh, Muslims of non-Turkish origin. And uh, in other countries, they encountered people of non-Muslim origin. So uh, it was uh, their basic premise of bringing people of different backgrounds yeah. around values uh, was tested and still being tested. So how open is the movement to leadership by non-Turks, non-Muslims uh, is an uh, ongoing challenge. Mm. Another challenge is, uh, has to do with the, uh, uh, the current situation in Turkey, uh, Turkey's uh, political leaders have actually chosen to scapegoat the movement and Mr. Gulen uh, for the political troubles. So the movement is facing uh, a substantial challenge there. I think another challenge is 
uh, the generational difference. Uh, now, today, we're talking about uh, over a million participants. So this movement, which started uh, with a few people, now mm -hmm. reached over a million people. Of course, there are at least three generations. So the generational gap in terms of how they look at uh, the concept of social movement, NGOs, their leadership and governance and everything, uh, there are certain tensions there. Mm, very interesting. And also, I appreciate the candidness with which you are responding to that question. Um, so. When the Hizmet movement thinks about uh, effectiveness, what does effectiveness mean for you as a movement? How do you define it, and when do you know that you're effective? Uh, in my view, the first criteria, criterion would be, uh, are you true to your uh, original values and your original mission? Uh, of course, uh, these are not necessarily easy to measure, uh, but uh, the people ultimately uh, are the uh, decider uh, on whether the organizations uh, or the groups stay true to their original mission. So this, uh, the, uh, the checks and balances that are provided by volunteers and the uh, fundraisers and the donors mm -hmm. uh, is always there and will always be there. But increasingly, uh, other measures of effectiveness are being adopted by NGOs and by uh, uh, individuals. Uh, these include uh, field-based or sector-based uh, uh, accountability measures, certain standards, uh, certain international standards uh, and uh, the mindset of the people who serve in these uh, NGOs mm -hmm. is changing to embrace these uh, more objective, more international standards mm. and make that part of their understanding of mm. their effectiveness. I'm going to put this a bit in black and white terms, but doesn't that kind of shift trend towards professionalization? if I can summarize it in a, uh, that way for a moment. Is there any tension between that shift towards professionalization and the, um, the intrinsic movement character of the yes. movement? There's always a tension uh, between strict professionalization and the, the volunteer uh, dedication yeah. uh, nature of the movement. And uh, people have to manage this tension and this balance uh, all the time. Uh, sometimes uh, either Mr. Gulen or other influential writers and speakers will speak to these topics, publications will come out, uh, institutional reviews will come out, and uh, they will self-evaluate with regard to these uh, issues. But this is a topic I know in the discussions of the boards of directors and uh, among the volunteers and the donors of the institutions. Very interesting. I'll be looking forward this afternoon in your talk, for instance, to the whole question of um, how do, does a movement like the HISMED movement relate to uh, development NGOs or relief NGOs, et cetera? But we'll leave that for, um, for, for the talk. So let me then finally turn to a question around um, a career advice uh, that you would like to give our students when they look at uh, playing a role like you're playing in one of the NGOs here in the US that, that uh, represents uh, this global movement. Um, Maybe first the question is, how does a, a day for you look like, or a day on the job for you look like? What kinds of things do you do in, in your job on a daily basis? Well, our function as an umbrella organization for six other uh, organizations is to help them do a better job in, in their mission. So uh, we provide uh, resources to these organizations, to their leaders. We arrange for their uh, regular meetings so that they can share best practices. Mm -hmm. uh, they can discuss their plans for the future, uh, for the coming year, their annual plans. Uh, we uh, give uh, recommendations to them. We evaluate their plans, uh, their uh, institutional documents. Uh, we also sometimes help them uh, uh, get together their resources so, so that they can achieve things that they cannot do individually. Mm -hmm. So that's our uh, umbrella function. Uh, we also have another function where we become an uh, intermediary uh, between the media and the think tanks and the, and the movement in the United States. So in a sense, we become a, a face for the movement, for those interested in studying the movement. Yeah, yeah. But what does it mean for what you do as an individual leader? Uh, for me, uh, my uh, current work involves uh, a lot of communication, a lot of research, uh, and, uh, and maybe I can jump directly to your uh, career advice. That, Go ahead. Uh, what I found most valuable uh, in my years, first as a professor and then a board director, uh, also uh, a leader of an educational institution, and now the leader of this in institution is, I find uh, people skills, uh, communication skills. Uh, are the most uh, crucial mm. uh, in almost every aspect uh, of my life. Uh, so I would uh, definitely urge uh, young potential leaders to invest in those uh, two categories. 
I cannot imagine any job where you can uh, do something just by yourself. So uh, people skills is uh, absolutely critical in, in, in the success of any organization that you will serve in. Mm -hmm. And communication skills is important because uh, it is absolutely necessary for uh, moving people, but it is also important for uh, preventing uh, obstacles and problems. So uh, maybe that, that aspect actually might be more important. And I regret that uh, some of these crucial skills are not actually thought uh, in many institutions. I, I was going to ask you, what can our students here at the Maxwell School, which is a public management and citizenship uh, school, what, what can they do in terms of coursework that helps them with those skills? Yeah, uh, I would definitely recommend a, a basic course uh, in psychology, uh, basic communication uh, principles, uh, I would uh, recommend uh, uh, developing skills of self-evaluation. Mm -hmm. Any courses that help evaluate yourself mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, determine uh, the, the psychological uh, foundations of, of the behavior. Uh, and, and to uh, both instill permanent change in yourself and also observe patterns among others mm -hmm. and be a positive force mm -hmm factor mm -hmm. uh, in changing uh, organizational behavior. Yeah, it's really interesting because in our work in the TNGO initiative on leadership development and in our leadership trainings, we, are, we put a lot of emphasis first on self-knowledge and self-reflection. Uh, we've done probably about 30 interviews in the last uh, four or five years, and you're the first leader to mention this aspect of psychology, understanding self and understanding others. Uh, I find that really striking. So I want to thank you very much for your well, interview you today, and I look me. forward to your talk. Thank you.